you both. Um, I, I have a, a question, and, and maybe I, I want to add a, an additional question, but I'll do it after my um, co-panelist um, asks her question. My first question is, um, listening to you guys discuss the different ways that FBI investigation and informant investigations are taking place, and listening to the SAR um, suspicious activity reporting, I just wonder why, um, if there is a reason why there has not been a legal challenge to the way these guidelines um, have been imposed, where they have been selectively enforced or sele selectively applied on certain communities. So even though they might be officially neutral, it's not, they're not specific towards one race or one religion or whatnot, the way that they seem to be enforced or applied seems to be very selective. And so has there ever, has there been historically or currently um, any sort of, of, of uh, legal um, uh, challenge. Uh, challenge, thank you, <laughs> wasn't coming. A legal challenge, either First Amendment or selective enforcement um, to this, and if not, is why, why not? And then I, I want to ask, my last question, which I don't answer this question, I answer it after my co-panelists, but uh, since this is such a gloom and doom, what can be done? Like, give us some brave light. Um, uh, case law on challenging um, the government for selective surveillance, selective investigation, uh, you know, even whether it's for race or political belief, uh, is not very strong. Um, and most of that is because it is very difficult to get any data about how these rules are actually being implemented. Uh, so we don't know how many investigations the FBI conducts and what percentage of the population is being investigated and why. We simply don't have that information in the public discussion, so it's very difficult to show a discriminatory effect when you can't get the data. Uh, we actually have uh, active Freedom of Information Act requests looking for the FBI's racial pro uh, racial mapping information and looking for their suspicious activity reporting programs. Uh, but it's very difficult to get the information, and when you get it, it's often very redact highly redacted, so it's very difficult to get a true picture, which is really part of the problem. I mean, we have this paradigm where instead of the way the Fourth Amendment set it up, where you have uh, the right to be left alone and the government has no right to invade your privacy absent probable cause, we have a government that feels that it, it is empowered to violate your rights even without any suspicion, uh, and you have no right to know what it's doing, which is highly damaging to a democracy, and that's something we have to fight. And as far as trying to improve things, um, you know, we have been pressing the administration since it's been in place uh, on the, uh, the to change the, the uh, DOJ guidance on racial profile. You know, and, and that would be one way because the racial profiling guidance is incorporated into the Attorney General guidelines and into the domestic investigations operators guide. So that would be one way of correcting the problem immediately. And I don't understand how you could possibly do a racial mapping program if you can't use race as a factor. Uh, so hopefully that will kill that program. So, you know, it's about getting educated, knowing what the issues are, knowing where the opportunities are to close the loopholes that they're exploiting. And I just uh, quickly, I was asked uh, to wrap up, so if we can uh, sum up uh, yes. the question, and we have five minutes, we can wrap up. Uh, thank you, and thank you to the panel. Uh, since this panel is on profiling, uh, I wanted to ask, um, and I, I believe this question would be to Shahid Buttar, uh, to uh, highlight a little bit more uh, the congressional hearings by Peter King that are expected, because it would seem that the purpose of these hearings is to make profiling acceptable on a national level at a much higher level and using a form of national political theater that congressional hearings often are, uh, and, and what sort of actions uh, can be taken to, to challenge that before the hearings take place and as they're taking place to, to really expose them as, um, 
as profiling. So maybe I'll, I'll start there and then might dovetail with my answer to the tail part of Green's question about what can we do. Um, so, you know, I, I live in D.C., I'm a lawyer. I tend to think that everything that happens in this town is more or less useless. We can't rely on lawyers, which is the, my answer to the first part of your question. You know, legal <laughs> challenges are, and I mean it, I mean, legal challenges are ultimately disempowering to movements. There's, there's a, and this gets back to the point about how we win mattering. If we win through an elite response that mobilizes small numbers of people to engage other elites, namely judges, to impose on our behalf restrictions on executive agencies, those are unsustainable victories. Because they can't be politically defended. We don't have the, the, the mobilization in the mass public. We haven't shifted the public consciousness. It, it's, it's, you could see, just to pick an example out of a hat, and this might be a controversial one in this crowd, but you'll get the point. Roe versus Wade, protected for women, a certain set of rights, in doing so, inflamed the mass movement among the conservative right wing that has now completely shifted the debate on reproductive rights. You don't even hear anybody make the argument anymore that reproductive freedom is crucial for women to have self-determination. Like, it doesn't even get mentioned. Why? Because the right wing has outmobilized us for a generation, piggybacking on the supposed false security of the Supreme Court decision. So even when we win legal victories, we set ourselves up for later failure, I think. Moreover, in the present tense, the federal judiciary has already been co-opted. We talked about the executive aggrandizement, Congress being complicit in it. The other factor in the equation is that the Supreme Court has basically been taken over by conservatives. And it, there's different ways to look at it, but one thing that is certainly true is that they're executively deferential, right? They're executive deferentialists in control of the Supreme Court, which is to say we can't ultimately look to the courts for meaningful protections in this lifetime. I mean, anybody who's alive today will not see the Supreme Court be a force for justice. I, I'm pretty convinced of that. And I, you know, that, so that might be sobering, that might be gloom, but the, the bright spot, and this gets back to the King hearings, and well, I guess one more point of doom, or on gloom on the way to the bright spot. Uh, I don't think there's anything we can do about the King hearings. I think the chance we had to head them off was last November. Um, and I don't think, again, anything useful, this is giving two minutes, I don't think anything useful happens in this town. So I think looking to the federal government, whether it's IRPA, whether it's the King hearings, whether it's, the, it's doomed, it doesn't work. All politics are local. The reason the right wing has the country by the throat is because they've been organizing locally in churches and communities all across the South and the West for the last 20 years. Now we're lucky that they, have, they don't have the whole country, but where they dominate, they dominate. Where we dominate, we don't dominate, we get together and we talk, you know? <laughs> and, and, and that's about organizing. And so the hopeful spot to me is to approach the levers where we do have access where we do have opportunities, and I think that's local and state politics, right? To get to a member of Congress, I, I just did this on Thursday, right? We organized a grassroots lobby day. There are people from all over the country. We go to 100 congressional offices to talk about reauthorization of the Patriot Act. One, I think one of our meetings was with an actual member of Congress. The rest were with staff. How do you get to a member of Congress? You either have 10,000 people or $10,000, right? If you don't have either of those things, you're not even going to get in the door. And then once you get in the door, what happens? Maybe they give you a photo op and they send you on your way. If you're lucky, they actually do something. And if you're really lucky, they're going to be able to convince the 250 people that they're going to need to in order to make anything useful happen. And then it's going to get whittled down on appeal before the Supreme right? It's, it, it, it doesn't work, right? But city council people, there's maybe like 10, 15, there might be 20 in your town. You don't need any money to get to them. They don't even have staff. They'll probably be really happy to hear from you. Right? You can do things in a city council, you can do things in a state legislature that are inconceivable at the federal government. Among the things that are inconceivable at the federal government right now is respecting the Constitution, and I think the opportunity, the bright spot, is for us at the local level to reach out again to those other communities, to the environmentalists, to the peace activists, to the Latinos, to the people who share our interests and constitutional rights to secure meaningful, enforceable rights in our towns, and that will shift the political dynamic it will shift the media discourse, it will shift everything. But we have to start small, and we have to start broad. And again, I'm very interested in working with anybody interested in that. There are campaigns here in D.C., one in Arlington County, one in Montgomery County, and one in D.C. to do precisely that here. If that interests you, please come talk to me after.